Alright, so first off, sorry there haven't been any videos in a while, but this one took way longer than I thought it would. Story of my life. The unfortunate byproduct of being a one-man channel and actually trying to put time and effort into my videos means that I'm not able to upload with the same frequency as some other channels. So I appreciate your patience, and without further ado, I present to you my top 10 films of 2008. So why 2008? Well, it's because the first top 10 of the year video I made on this channel was my 2009 list. Since then, I've made one top 10 of the year list each year and will continue going forward in time doing so. But now since this is my full-time job thanks to Patreon and all of you awesome supporters, I figure I might as well try to cover every year I can and start going backwards in time in between those other lists. Now this list doesn't just exist to let you know how I've organized the films I've seen from a certain year. It exists because I want to be able to introduce people to films that they'll love. I want to provide a service to you guys by spending countless hours tracking down these films and weeding them out from the mediocre so you don't have to. After all, if I'm going to spend 83% of my time on this channel bashing movies and demanding a higher standard, it only makes sense that I should spend the remaining sixth of my time trying to introduce you to films that show that a higher standard is achievable. Now obviously that statement applies more to films that are higher on the list, but regardless, every one of these films is something that I would find to be worth recommending. And because of that, I don't confine myself to only having 10 movies in my list. If there's 30 movies in a year that are worth recommending, then my list will be 30 movies movies long. If there's only five movies in a year that are worth recommending, then my list will be five movies long. Anyway, watch this video, and I'm sure that there'll be at least one film on this list that'll catch your interest. And if I help introduce you to a movie that you love, then I've done my job. Starting out this list at number 18 is a Belgian film called X Drummer. Now let me start out by saying that if you're a person that needs a trigger warning before watching something, then not only do I issue one for my entire channel right now, but this is definitely not something that you'd want to watch. This movie is offensive to nearly every group imaginable, even ones that I associate with myself. But I think it's important to understand the difference between ideas being promoted by a film and ones being promoted by characters within the film. This movie's got some pretty scuzzy characters in it, but I don't think that it ever promotes them as being good people. Now the reason why I'm promoting this film is not because of any interpreted stance on social or political issues. It's because the film succeeds in doing its job at being entertaining and way over the top. It's got as much stylization as train spotting with as much offensiveness as South Park. Now, I'm not sure I would call this film better than either of those things, but it's certainly reminiscent of the two and it's a blend that makes for quite an entertaining movie. The main characters are members of a handicapped punk rock band, so if you like the music you're hearing right now, then you'll probably love the soundtrack to this movie. Any issues I have with the movie are fairly minor and can mostly be attributed to subjective preferences over how a scene is delivered. The movie has many unrealistic moments, but they're far from unintentional. I mean, when one of your character's names is Big Dick and he's got a penis the size of my arm, it would be difficult for me to pretend as though this movie's trying to be completely serious. Anyway, if it looks like it's up your alley, then go check it out, and if it doesn't look like it's up your alley, then I would recommend checking out something else on this list. I give you a blood in it, I can also give you a Omdat we dikke lul. Waarom noemen ze je eigenlijk als op? Is dat overdrachtelijk? Overdrachtelijk, mijn kloe. Erna, je noemt ik kom ik hier. Laat u het bezoek je zien waarom dat ze mijn dikke lul noemen. Hallo, ho, TV, ho. Hallo, laat ik je zien, zo. Ik ben aan het andere, hè. Ik kan nog boot. Spel. Min kreos. Zou je wat kijken, nee, man? Vette dat stil hier. Oh. Is dat wel best? Ja. Next up at number 17 is Bronson from the director of Drive, a movie starring Tom Hardy where he gets naked and beats people up. The story's based on a real person who is commonly referred to as Britain's most violent prisoner. The film is not only hilarious, but it's often very weird, with strange stylistic choices that are rather fitting considering the story's being told through the perspective of a madman. It's well acted, it's well shot, and some parts are a little fucked up, so if this looks like your cup of tea, then I would suggest checking it out. 
problem is, once you get comfortable, or sometimes even before, they ghost you again and again, moving you from prison to prison to prison. And I fucking hate that. Parkhurst, God bless that place. The accommodation was more than worthy of my royal self. Your own bed. Toilet. A sink. The food was of exceptional standard. Where? Yes, Parkhurst was a cool car. And how prison well, what can I say? Well worth a visit. Scrubs, not my favourite place to visit, but the staff are ready to make your stay as memorable as possible. We had a laugh. How we laugh. At number 16 on my list is a Spanish horror film called Wreck. Now, unfortunately, many of you have already seen the shitty American remake titled Quarantine, so hopefully if you have seen it, it was a long time ago and you've already forgotten the majority of it, because this movie is leagues better than that pile of garbage. Over four years ago when this channel was just starting up and my editing was really shitty and 19-year-old me still hadn't found my own style yet, I made a review of Quarantine explaining just why it was so incredibly shitty compared to Wreck. What Wreck did so well is avoid what makes other horror movies so bad. Yes, it's a found footage movie, but it's one of few where the characters actually have a legitimate reason to be recording. Yes, there are some jump scares in the film, but the startling sounds are never the product of cheap orchestra hits or sound effects that don't exist in the story's universe. Yes, there are still some minor cliches and conveniences in the film, but its achievements far outweigh its flaws, and I would consider this movie to be a shining example of found footage done right. Rather than having every single action and plot device happen directly in front of the camera at all times, it cleverly clues you in that other important sequences of events are taking place in the same building that you can't see. Rather than feeling cheap and making lame excuses as to why the cameraman has to be anywhere that anything's happening at all times, instead we're often able to see the aftermath of events taking place where the cameraman isn't. And the movie's able to feel much more realistic because it gives us the impression that there's more to the universe than what's directly in front of the cameraman's face. If you like horror movies, then I would strongly I strongly recommend this one because I consider it to be one of the best. Enseguida la trasladaremos a un hospital. ¿Cómo se llaman amigos de los cojones? Conchita. Conchita. Conchita, tranquila. Por favor, por favor. Hombre. Tranquila, la policía ya está aquí. No tengo cuidado, a ver si me van a echar. Next up at number 15 is Doubt, starring Meryl Streep and Philip Seymour Hoffman. Now, it's interesting to note about this one is that it's based off of a Pulitzer Prize and Tony Award-winning stage play. So not only is it very dialogue and character-driven, but fortunately the writer-slash-director of this film, John Patrick Shanley, is the actual writer from that original play. So rather than being an adaptation that might bastardize or misinterpret, what you see in the film perfectly matches the intent of the source material. Now, although I haven't seen the original stage play, I found myself quite impressed with the adaptive choices that were made. When using film as a medium, you're able to convey points to the audience by using editing techniques rather than explaining them directly. Just a simple cut between two different settings can show so much contrast when they're one after the other. Wait, wait, how bad is she? What, the mother or the daughter? Uh, the, the daughter. I never met the daughter. <laughs> what about the mother? Fat! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
It's choices like these that make me appreciate that the director actually tried to utilize film to the best of its ability to tell the story. You can tell that it's adapted from a stage play, but it doesn't feel like they just filmed a stage play. The majority of the film also has really good shot composition, so it doesn't feel like it's made by an inexperienced filmmaker. And last but not least, all of the performances are fantastic. Meryl Streep, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Amy Adams, and Viola Davis all received Academy Award nominations for their performances in this film. Each one of them was able to perform their characters believably and consistently, and there are several moments in the film where each of them are really given an opportunity to shine. There are some minor editing issues that I won't even explain in case you don't notice them yourselves, but overall this makes for not only a great adaptation, but a great film regardless. So check it out. He laid his head on the desk and... some... Do you mean you had some impression? Yes. I didn't come from the rectory, so you're asking me. Mm. That's it. Hmm. 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 <clears throat> Did you want to discuss the pageant? Is that why I'm here? Is this what you wanted to discuss? This. Well, I'm a little uncomfortable. Why? Why do you think? Uh, the boy's well-being is my responsibility. Uh, his well-being is not an issue. I'm not satisfied that that is true. He was upset when he returned to class. Did he say something? No. What happened in the rectory? Happened? Hmm. Nothing happened. I had a talk with a boy. What about? Private matter. He's 12 years old. What could be private? Should I get the- No! Next up at number 14 is The Dark Knight. Now just because this movie is one of the most overrated movies of all time does not mean that this movie is not good. There are quite a few issues I have with this film, but like every other film on this list, its achievements outweigh its flaws. I for one think it makes sense to appreciate a director that can make a giant blockbuster action movie in this day and age and not resort to CGing the crap out of it. This whole tunnel scene with explosions and the Batmobile jumping fucking cars and shit, those were all practical effects and I appreciate the effort put into them. When I think about what I appreciate in a film like this one, I try to think of other films in the same genre and what this did differently to make it better. Not only are practical effects an unfortunate rarity in the genre at this point, but one aspect that people often ignore in this genre is the performances. Regardless of the hype around Heath Ledger's death, his performance of the Joker is debatably the best performance in any superhero movie ever. Hey, what do you know? It's Black Dynamite. Heath Ledger was able to transform himself into his character in a way that few actors are able to. Not only did he deliver a groundbreaking performance in the film, but the other actors in the film also held their own in a way that's unfortunately rare for this genre. The score by Hans Zimmer was great, and the choices for when to use the score were admirable. Going back to the tunnel chase scene as a reference, I appreciate the intelligent restraint shown by not including music. Although music can help push for an intended tone in a film, if the tone of the scene is already conveyed at maximum intensity without the score, sometimes adding music just because you think you're supposed to only winds up harming the immersion. When you're left to focus on the visuals and the sounds coming from the action itself, and especially in a film where music has already been present throughout, it cues your brain into subconsciously thinking, shit just got real and this is fucking serious. Because of that, that the scene's able to bring so much intensity as it does. This level of conscious restraint is also unfortunately a rarity within the genre. Many directors would have unintentionally ruined the impact of the scene just because adding stock action music is part of their studio checklist. To help prove my point, I'm going to play the same scene again except this time I've added the soundtrack from a different part of the movie. Now 
as you can tell, there's nothing inherently wrong with the score, but depending on the scene, sometimes the movie just works better without. Fortunately enough, Christopher Nolan not only has a mind of his own, but he's got a good feel for how to present things cinematically. Now, I'm a type of person that likes to watch a movie more than once and notice new things on each watch. The better a movie is, the more likely it is that each new detail brings newfound appreciation for the film rather than taking away from its immersion. So if there's one huge issue I have with The Dark Knight, it's that it's a movie that gets worse each time I watch it. The majority of what there is to appreciate about the film is what I'd consider to be pretty surface level. Once you hit a certain point, the more you think about it, the less immersive it is. Now, some people think that this is the case for every movie and wind up saying things like, you're not supposed to think about it, you should just enjoy it. But I can confidently say that the number one film on this list is the exact opposite. There are a few hiccups in The Dark Knight that break the immersion for me at specific points. The awkward pandering towards a PG-13 rating. Why so serious? The explosion at the police station that somehow incapacitates everyone in the room except the Joker? Like, let's just all forget how ridiculous the Joker's plan was anyway. So it was your whole plan to be locked up in the MCU? The Joker planned to be caught. He wanted me to lock him up in the MCU. Would your entire plan to escape not have been foiled if one of the guards wasn't stupid enough to get close to you? The impossible letter P sounds coming from Harvey Dent even though half of his mouth can't close to make the sound? I picked up Rachel words. Must have been Maroney's man. Shut up! Are you telling me that you're gonna protect the other traitor in Gordon's unit? If they filmed his scenes with something in his mouth keeping half of it open, then the sounds being made would be accurate. Obviously, the fact that they didn't do that doesn't ruin the movie for me. I mean, come on, it's on this list. But doing it differently would have changed this detail from something that breaks immersion once you think about it into something that gives new appreciation when you think about it. My bias when it comes to movies is that I like to think about them. And as I explained, there were many choices in this movie that were made that do give me a level of appreciation. If this movie didn't do so much right, then it wouldn't be on this list. And I don't believe that those small hiccups are any excuse for me not to think that this is a great movie. If this movie looks like it interests you and somehow you haven't already seen it yet, then I guess check it out. Tell them your name. Ryan. <laughs> are you the real Batman? No. No? No. No. <laughs> then why do you dress up like him? <laughs> 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 He's a symbol that we don't yeah. have to be afraid of scum like you. Yeah. You do, Brian. You really do. Huh? Yeah. Oh, shh, 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 shh. So you think Batman's made Gotham a better place? Hmm? Yeah. Look at me. Look at me! You see, this is how crazy Batman's made Gotham. You want order in Gotham. Batman must take off his mask and turn himself in. Oh, and every day he doesn't, people will die. Starting tonight. I'm a man of my word. <laughs> And number 13 is a Swedish vampire movie called Let the Right One In. And similarly to how I felt sorry for people who watched Quarantine before Wreck, if you've seen the American movie called Let Me In, you've seen the shitty version of this great movie. If you're wondering what stupid changes were made, Twin Perfect has a pretty good video explaining it. What Matt Reeves has done in creating Let Me In is taken a thoughtful, understated love story with a dark streak and repackaged it as a horror movie for what he thinks is a simple-minded audience lacking the power of inference. I don't have inference. Vision. No, in inference, like you infer things from the visual cues and dialogue and stuff. Oh, so like I don't need things to be spelled out for me like you're doing right now? No. <laughs> Whatever. The hallmark of American popcorn movies is lack of subtlety, and Let Me In is not subtle. It constantly reminds you of what you're supposed to be thinking, how you should feel, what's happening while it's happening, and basically includes everything that lets you know that a movie is taking place. Basically, the original is smart and subtle, and the remake is unsurprisingly stupid and pandering. You may be surprised to hear this about a vampire movie, but the most important part about this movie is the characters. Each one of them is very well written and also very well performed. The effects in the movie are great for the most part, and things are generally shown in a clever and subtle way. The only issue I have with the movie is a little logistical issue during an important part that does take me out of it for a bit. There's no real way to explain it without spoiling it, and I think this is a great movie anyway, so go check it out. Look at 
Dann kommt es nicht. Wie ist der Winter? Nein. Wohl für dich? Ja, wir glauben zu meinem Jahr. Hm, sie ist im Mund. Ja. At number 12 is Frost Nixon, directed by Ron Howard. The film is about the famous interview between David Frost and Richard Nixon after he resigned the presidency. All of the performances in this movie are great, and the way that it was filmed was pretty interesting. This film also had accompanying interview dialogue, but the interview footage was coming from the actors playing the characters. This is a nice way to help us believe that those are the actual people in the story. It's very dialogue-driven, but I didn't find it slow or dull in the slightest. One could argue that this dramatic re telling serves as a puff piece for David Frost, but I don't really care. It's not a movie that's trying to be a documentary, it's just trying to tell an entertaining story. And the story they told was one that I thought worked very well. I also enjoyed checking out the actual interviews on YouTube after the movie. It was cool to see what changes were made to turn it into more of a dramatic film. Anyway, I thought this movie had a great presentation and I found it to be very entertaining. Uh, you know, the fellows would throw me a question and I would try and anticipate what his response might be. Okay, the White House taping system. Ours was not the first administration to use taping systems. Lyndon Johnson's White House used them, so did Kennedy. Houston plant, wiretapping, and alleged abuses of power. Let me tell you other administrations were up to far worse. Uh, and just for fun, your close friend, Jack Kennedy. That man, he screwed anything that moved, <laughs> fixed elections, and took us into Vietnam. And the American people, they loved him for it. Where is I? Richard Milhouse Nixon worked around the clock in their service, and they hated me. Look, look, now I'm sweating. Damn it, damn it. And Kennedy's so goddamn handsome, I'm blue-eyed, and women all over him. He screwed anything that moved and everything. Had a go at checkers once. The poor little bitch was never the same. At number 11 is Changeling, directed by Clint Eastwood. Despite Angelina Jolie usually being given a lot of crappy roles, this is one movie that helps solidify her as a great actor. Who would have thought she would work so well as a 1928 single mother? Not only does she pull off the character very well, but the story gives her many opportunities to shine. The story revolves around her character's child going missing, and the struggles she faces trying to bring him back. There isn't really anything in this movie that seems unfitting or out of place, and awesome enough Enough, the child actors were good enough that they never diminished the quality of the film. This is a great story with a fantastic performance to drive it along, and I would recommend checking it out. Oh, no, of course not. You just told the papers we couldn't tell one boy from another as a compliment for the months we spent working on your case. You trying to make fools out of us? Is that it? You enjoy this? Of course not. I, I want you to find my son. You know what your problem is, Mrs. Collins? You're trying to shirk your responsibilities as a mother. What? You enjoyed being a free woman, didn't you? You enjoyed... Not having to worry about a young son. You could go where you wanted, do whatever you wanted, see anyone you wanted. But then we found your son, we brought him back, and now he's an inconvenience to you. And that's why you cooked up this scheme. To throw him to the state and get the state to raise him for you. Isn't that true? That is not true. No? Well, even the boy says he's your son. Why would he say that? How would he know to do that? I don't know. I just know he's lying. Or maybe so. Maybe he is a liar. But that's how he's been trained, isn't it? Lion was born in both of you. You're a liar and a troublemaker, and if you ask me, you got no business walking the streets of Los Angeles. Wait a minute. Because either you know you're lying or you're not capable of knowing if you're lying or telling the truth. So which is it? Your derelict mother or just plain nuts? Because from where I sit, those are the only options. I'm not gonna sit here and take this. You want experts, you want doctors? I have a few of my own, Matrix. 
At number 10 is a dark comedy called In Bruges, starring Colin Farrell. The film is about two hitmen hiding out in Bruges, awaiting orders from their employer. Things happen that I'm not gonna explain because it would spoil the movie, but I will say that the movie is very entertaining and has a good sense of dark humor. There are some action thriller elements to it, but it's mostly a comedy. And how refreshing it is to see a comedy that doesn't completely do away with the idea of consequence. The two main characters have an entertaining contrast and they work very well together comedically. Like I said, I don't want to spoil too much, so I'm just going to leave it at that and say that you should check it out. Up there, the top altar, is a file brought back by a Flemish knight from the Crusades in the Holy Land. And that file, do you know what it's said to contain? No, what's it said to contain? It's said to contain some drops of Jesus Christ's blood. Yeah, that's how this church got its name. Basilica of the Holy Blood. Yeah. Jesus fucking blood, isn't it? Of course you don't fucking have to. Of course you don't fucking have to. At number 9 is an animated Israeli film called Waltz with Bashir. The film is based on the 1982 invasion of Lebanon and its presentation is very unique. As you can already tell, its animation style is quite engaging, but its unique presentation doesn't stop there. The film is part drama and part biography with the director playing himself. He goes around interviewing fellow veterans of the invasion with the goal of helping to reconstruct his own memories of the experience. The interviews are animated as a dramatic retelling of those events and their all done in a very artistic way. And holy crap, the soundtrack for this movie is surprisingly great. Not only is the accompanying music emotional and fitting, but there was even a lot of purpose that went into deciding which songs the soldiers were listening to. This is a fantastic film and I would highly recommend it. At number 8 is a French movie titled I've Loved You So Long. And this is another movie that gets spoiled the more you talk about it, so I'm gonna leave this plot description pretty vague. The movie is about a woman getting out of prison after a long time and moving in with her sister. The details behind those events are revealed one by one during the course of the film. Each new piece of information builds in synchronicity with the actor's performances, turning the film into an emotional powerhouse by the end of it. I would have preferred for the soundtrack to sound a bit more professional, but that's also something that improves as the film crescendos towards the end. It's well shot and it's very well written, but what steals the show is Kristen Scott Thomas's performance, who's able to convey so much through her silent expressions that it makes her character extremely relatable. This movie is pretty sad, but I think it's great, so grab some tissues and check it out. Arrêtez pas de me reluquer. Tu... Tu cherches un mec. Alors 
S'il te plaît. Euh... Non, pas du tout. Mais c'est pas grave. Ok. At number seven is a Belgian slash French comedy drama called El Dorado. It's a movie that you can tell is fairly low budget, but the story's written in a way that it doesn't call for anything more. The movie's 80 minutes long, so expect it to be pretty short, but it was well made enough that the movie was in my head anyway long after it had finished. This is also a film with a great soundtrack, and the tone of each song matches each scene perfectly. The film is about a man who discovers a thief in his home, but after learning more about him, he becomes sympathetic and decides to give him a ride to his parents in town. So it's like a really well-made, short, quirky road trip movie in a way. The film is mostly comedic, but when it tries to hit an emotional note, it hits it very well. And interestingly enough, the movie was directed by the actor playing the main character in the film. He's acted in a couple other movies that I've recommended, but I didn't know he could direct until I saw this film. After watching this, it's clear he has a knack for it, and I'll be sure to check out one of his other films in the future. This movie is quite the hidden gem, and I would suggest checking it out. No, je sens plus rien du tout. Aïe Si tu vois que tu sens tes jambes, allez, lève-toi maintenant. J'ai mal, je crois que j'ai quelque chose de cassé. Mon cul, allez, lève-toi. Mais j'ai vraiment mal, je te jure. Retourne-toi. Quoi Retourne-toi. Laisse tes mains bien l'apparence. Je... Elle est où ta lame J'ai pas de lame. Elle est où ta lame J'ai pas de lame. Hier tu m'as dit que t'avais une lame, elle est où ta lame Je te dis que je devais une lame parce que j'avais peur que tu me casses la gueule. Mais, mais j'ai pas de lame, je te jure que j'ai rien. Je te préviens, tu me fais un coup de chien, je t'arrache la gueule, tu sais ça Mais je te jure que j'ai rien. Me frappe plus. Je t'ai pas encore frappé. Est-ce que t'as mal Non. Là ou ça là Là. At number six is a Turkish film called Three Monkeys from the director of Once Upon a Time in Anatolia. Now even though that film didn't make my 2011 list, I still really enjoyed it. And after having it sit for a while and still remembering some parts of it very well, I almost feel as though I should have included it somewhere near the bottom. Not only that, but this director has now won the Palme d'Or from Cannes Film Festival for his newest film, Winter Sleep. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's the best picture award for what I would consider to be the best film festival. An award that has also been given to my favorite director for his two most recent films. Anyway, Three Monkeys wound up winning the Best Director Award back in 2008. And from the way this was shot, I can totally see why. This director is one that excels at atmosphere. Not only is everything extremely well shot with some fantastic cinematography, but there was also a lot of noticeable effort put into the sound design, with many unique Foley sounds to help emphasize the tone. I understand that this film might be a little slower paced than what some people are used to, but I don't consider it boring in the slightest. The way that things are set up visually often gives you something to absorb apart from the dialogue, like the choice to keep their lives in their home so dark in contrast to what you see outside. I know that some of you would probably like to hear a plot summary, but I think it's better to just watch the film develop itself. Not only that, but plot summaries do nothing to explain the quality of the film in comparison to presentation. And aside from a couple short moments in this film that were noticeably dubbed, the presentation of this movie is absolutely fantastic.
And number five is a documentary called Dear Zachary, A Letter to a Son About His Father. This is the most depressing movie ever made. If you can watch this without crying, let me know because so far I have not been able to do that. Again, try not to search up too much about it because it might diminish your experience, but this is without a doubt the saddest movie I have ever seen. The documentary is told through the perspective of a filmmaker whose friend was murdered by his own wife. Part of what makes the documentary so incredibly powerful is that because of his connection, it never feels emotionally detached. The pacing and editing is told through the perspective of someone who's not just narrating the events, but someone who is emotionally suffering as a result of those events. If you're gonna watch this movie, just understand that you will be crying at some point. This is one where I'm gonna let the trailer speak for itself. Unfortunately, she made it to Canada before they could arrest her. On the afternoon of November 7th, 2001, my sister called to tell me that Dr. Andrew Bagby, my closest friend since the age of seven, had been killed. My name's Kurt and I'm a filmmaker. Andrew appeared in every movie I made growing up. Jesus Christ, Kurt, Kurt what do you want? I mean, no, no, I just need, I, I'm just... I decided to make a movie, to travel far and wide, to interview everyone who ever knew and loved Andrew. Kurt, I just gotta call from Mrs. Bagby. The abbreviated version is that bitch, uh, held a press conference and announced she's four months pregnant with Andrew's baby. They can't prove it until the child's born. If it is true, the Bagbys are gonna sue for custody. She named the little boy Zachary. To seek custody of the only grandson they would ever have, Andrew's parents moved to St. John's, Newfoundland, where Shirley Turner was unbelievably allowed to walk free on bail while awaiting extradition. In order to see Zachary, Kate and David were forced to stomach a civil relationship with the woman they knew murdered their only son. And number four is a movie called Funny Games US from that two-time Palm d'Or winning favorite director of mine, Michael Haneke, I was talking about. I may sometimes struggle to pronounce his name, but it is no struggle to enjoy his films. Now, the reason why it's called Funny Games US is because it's a shot-for-shot -shot American remake of his own Austrian film from 10 years before. The film even went so far as to create the cabin with the exact same proportions using the blueprints from the original building. In my opinion, this remake is far better than the original. Despite it being recreated shot-for-shot, -shot, the camera quality is much better and so are many of the performances. Brady Corbett's performance drastically changes the character's disposition from the original and I think it works much better in this film. Now I love this movie, but out of all of the films on this list, it's probably the least accessible when it comes to recommending it to people. Many people who expected this to be a horror film interpret part of the movie as one big fuck you to the audience. And that's not entirely untrue, but how you decide to react to it is dependent on whether or not you understand what the film is going for. Many people wind up disliking this film without understanding anything about the director. Many people dislike this film as a horror movie without realizing that it's actually a commentary on horror movies. There's even a point to this film taking place in the US and the 1997 version was only filmed in Austria for practical reasons at the time. What's interesting to me is how drastically different the reception to these films were just because of the audiences they were exposed to. And that might partially be due to the marketing because back in 2008 when I first watched this movie and didn't know anything about the director, I was going into this movie expecting I'd be watching a horror movie instead of an art movie. After my first viewing I was not only taken by surprise but I was a little confused. And sure enough not only did the the film grow on me over time, but it wound up helping me discover my favorite director. If you're the type of person that likes to think and absorb while watching a movie, then this is a movie that does get better with each repeated viewing. Now for those of you who are unable to enjoy the movie because of the intentional alternative choices that it makes, don't ever think for a second that I feel as though it's illegitimate to dislike the film. If you understand what the film is going for and you're unable to enjoy it regardless, then at least you can say you tried. When one gets upset at someone else for not being able to enjoy a movie, Movie, I consider it to be nothing short of obnoxious and closed-minded. The idea of telling someone to enjoy something that they can't is to me a sign of lower intelligence. But if you're going to take it one step further and go from saying that you were unable to enjoy the movie to, therefore, it was a terrible movie, then you'd have to be ignoring everything that this movie did so amazingly well. If you've heard me talk about Hanukkah's movies before, then you already know that he's a master at cinematography. And once again, he's able to bring out the best of every actor he works with. With. I'm extremely comfortable with saying that this is among the best performances for both Naomi Watts and Tim Roth. And how could you not at least respect a fantastic child performance when they're so hard to come by regardless of the genre? Anyway, I consider this to be a great film, and if you're interested in looking more into its meaning, the information's everywhere online if you want to look it up. Who knows, I might make an analysis video someday, but there's another movie higher up this list that takes precedence over it. I for one was able to enjoy this film very much, and I hope that many of you are able to as well. Come on, hurry up. 
Sit dark. down. It's dark in here. Come on, don't fall asleep. Okay, we bet. What time is it? 8.40. That in, let's say, 12 hours, all three of you are going to be <laughs> kaput. Okay? What? You bet that you'll be alive tomorrow at 9 o'clock, and we bet that you'll be dead. Okay? They don't want to bet. Well, it's not an option. There has to be a bet. I mean, what do you think? You think they stand a chance? Well, you're on their side, aren't you? Who are you betting on, hmm? At number three is Burn After Reading by the Coen Brothers. This hilarious dark comedy with an all-star cast is well shot, well written, and very well acted. With actors like Brad Pitt and George Clooney who more often than not wind up playing the roles of Brad Pitt and George Clooney, it's refreshing to see them play unique characters and have them performed so well. From the subtle neurotic twitches and seemingly ADHD behavior from George Clooney's character, to the not-so-subtle dopey disposition of Brad Pitt's character, this movie offers a wide variety of entertaining, and well-performed characters. As expected from the Coen brothers, it's not your typical comedy. The music plays out in a seemingly serious but parodic tone, similarly to Coen brothers' 2009 film A Serious Man, which I would also recommend. In a way, it's kind of a parody movie of the spy genre, but one wherein they want to break your expectations and make fun of movie cliches. Not only are intentional red herrings shown throughout the film as part of the joke, but there's a little bit of commentary in how certain characters act. Brad Pitt and Francis McDormand's character Characters consistently make their decisions as though they think they're living in a cliched spy movie, giving the impression that their characters have probably seen too many movies. Part of the hilarity of the film is how its universe consistently shuts them down for having false expectations. It's as though the film's saying to the audience, we're gonna make the movie we want to make because those other movies are fucking stupid. Its humor exists on many levels, with both outward ridiculousness and small subtleties. So although you can find humor in this movie no matter what type of watcher you are, you're really not getting the full experience unless you're actually paying attention. It's a movie that has humor throughout but doesn't necessarily make it obvious where the jokes are. Much of the humor is found in how characters act rather than simply delivering punchlines the whole movie. Anyway, this is a great comedy from two great directors and I would recommend checking it out. So give him a tinkle? Oh my god. Why? Because he's gonna want to know that his shit is secure. He, 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 he's gonna be relieved. He might even be so relieved that he gives us a reward. I would be very fucking surprised if he did not. Oh, wow. Very surprised. Like the, you know, Good Samaritan tax. Which is not even a tax, really, since it's voluntary. Osborne? Osborne Cox? Yes. Uh, who is this? Um, this, um, is this Osborne Cox? Who is this? What time is it? Who are you? Um, I'm a good Samaritan. I'm sorry I'm calling at such an hour, but I thought you might be worried. About the security of your shit. At number two is an Austrian thriller called Revanche. The best way to describe the plot of the movie is to let you know that the English translation to the title is Revenge. The film has some impressive cinematography, and its eerie tone and pacing allows for some legitimate tension in the story. I love how subtle but purposeful the reincorporated shots and dialogue are throughout the film. Each character is well developed and although there is much conflict, it never presents itself in a black and white way. So much so that even though there are characters that are guilty in their actions, 
actions, I found myself relating and being sympathetic towards them regardless. It's an incredibly layered story with incredibly layered characters, and there's always something that the film gives you to chew on during each scene. This is a fantastic movie that I would consider to be accessible to most everyone, but if you're going to watch it, let me first explain one thing. The film takes place in Austria, but Tamara's character is originally from Ukraine. Since she doesn't speak perfect German, the subtitles translate it to broken English. There are also moments in the film where she's speaking Russian, but since the film's language is German and she's not speaking German, those parts are not subtitled. This is done so that you can get the same experience that you would if you were a German speaker that couldn't understand Russian. So if you don't see subtitles right away when the movie starts, don't worry, there's probably nothing wrong with your SRT file and Criterion did not butcher the subtitles for their Blu-ray. It's just an artistic choice that was made so that people watching in different languages will more or less get the same experience. Suffice it to say, there was a lot of thought and effort put into this movie, and its gripping story and well-written characters are sure to have you thinking about the movie long after it's over. And who is the woman? Is it right to you? Do you take it? No. Do you have to say it? How did you react? Did he say that I should not think? Wollt ihr ficken? Sag die Wahrheit. Was ist das? Du bist nicht klar. Was ist das? Gib das Wort. Du bist nicht klar. Hast du Angst gehabt? <laughs> and my favorite film from 2008 is... Synecdoche, New York by my favorite screenwriter, Charlie Kaufman. This is my second favorite film of all time, right behind The Holy Mountain. Similarly to The Holy Mountain, this is a film that you can watch dozens of times and still find new ways to appreciate it with each watch. It's incredibly complex and deserves to be watched at least twice, but it's not something that you can't enjoy unless you watch it at least twice. There are endless layers and details to be picked up that not only contribute to the film's meaning, but ones that help you better understand the characters and the story itself. Although this is Charlie Kaufman's directorial debut and quite an amazing one at that, he's written amazing movie after amazing movie before, and if you haven't seen these movies, then you should get on that as soon as you can. The film follows Caden Cotard, played by Philip Seymour Hoffman, a playwright who ambitiously aims to tell a brutally honest story about death. The film itself aims to be brutally honest as well, focusing on regrets, missed opportunities, and the harsh reality that time is slipping through our fingers. The film is expertly crafted with each detail acting as a clue towards the bigger picture. Like I said, the film's complex, but it's not something that you won't get anything out of if you don't completely understand it. So try not to feel too intimidated by its complexity, because if you don't watch this movie, you are missing out on a masterpiece. And hell, don't just take my word for it. Roger Ebert himself called this the best film of the decade. The alternative choices made in the film are far from random bullshit, and everything has a purpose. As many of you already know, I personally can't stand movies that are filled with alternative choices that can be described as nothing other than random bullshit. This is not just a movie that's different, it's different with a purpose. Even the lyrics in the song's soundtrack were written by Charlie Kaufman and add extra layers to the film. I just think that there's a kind of a, a very, very kind of one root way of making movies in this culture. And that, and that there seems to be sort of this mindset that it has to be this one thing and this is the structure of it and this is this is what has to happen to the characters and and I think that there's a like in anything like in any art form there's the the the, what the, the world opens up when you take that away I, I wanted to sort of try to create a way in my mind that you could view the same piece of film on different occasions and have different experiences with it which is what I was referring to when I said theaters you can watch a play five times and it's going to be different every time because it's alive the audience relation to a movie doesn't affect the movie. The movie's already set in stone, you know? Um, so what you can offer people, or at least what I've decided I would like to try to offer people is an ability to watch this movie now 
and watch it in five years and have a different experience because you're a different person. Or watch it tomorrow and have a different experience because there are things you can not see the first time. There's too much to see or, or you don't have the information at the beginning of the experience to, to see things at the, at the beginning of movie that will only be revealed at the end of the movie. I just think that stuff is fun and it's what I want as an audience, so it's what I try to kind of incorporate. This is a beautiful film and it's the first thing I thought of watching to pay tribute to Philip Seymour Hoffman when he passed away. Not just because of the subject matter, but because this is also one of his best performances. This is one of the best movies I've ever seen and it's a fine example of a 10 out of 10 movie for me. And I hope that many of you enjoy watching it enough to want to watch it again. We'll start by talking honestly. And out of that, a uh, piece of theater will evolve. I'll begin. I've been thinking a lot about dying lately. You're gonna be fine, sweetie. I appreciate that, Claire, but... Oh, you are, you poor thing. You know, regardless of how this particular thing works itself out, I will be dying. And so will you. And so will everyone here. <clears throat> and that, that's what I want to explore. We're all hurtling towards death. Yet here we are for the moment, alive. Each of us knowing we're, we're gonna die. Each of us secretly believing we won't. It's brilliant. It, it's everything. It's caramel top. I'm singing this. I highly recommend this film and plan to release an analysis video explaining it, hopefully within the next month. Not only do I need to catch up on making the next YMS video and also have Vancouver Film Fest this month, and also need to start doing some more prepping so I can release the YMS of that third season of that TV show for November, but it's important to me that you try watching it at least once with a blank slate before I make that video. Well, there you have it, my top 18 uh, 2008. If you found a film from this list and wound up enjoying it, please let me know in the comments section. I put a lot of time and effort into finding and tracking down these movies for you guys, so it's nice to know if it does a little good. Also, if you're the type that leans towards tortillas, I encourage you to support the artist by purchasing anything you wind up enjoying. If there ever were to be a huge demand for something different, then we might see a bit more of a variety in mainstream cinema. Fortunately, however, studios are no longer necessary Necessary to fund films. Charlie Kaufman's upcoming animated feature Anomalisa wound up getting kickstarted, so I'm glad there's enough interest on him to be able to fund future projects regardless. Anyway, watch the movies, enjoy the movies, buy the movies, eat the movies, touch the boobies, and stay tuned on this channel for more of me bashing stupid shit.